Well, we're really excited to host Rick Atkinson at another Grand Valley event. This Liberation Trilogy of his has been a blockbuster in all of the trite senses of the word, but in a profound sense, in a very important sense, he has set the bar very high for the narrative history of the most consequential war in human history. This Liberation Trilogy, the three volumes of it, each one of them, prize-winning, award, uh, accolade, attracting volumes, his guns at last light, is just being issued as a paperback today. So we're there on the, uh, the birth of the paperback today, and that's why there's so many of them out on the counter. And we are hoping, of course, that there will be none left at the end of the evening. <laughs> so Rick has uh, agreed to stay long enough to uh, autograph your, your copies. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rick Atkinson. Well, thank you for that, Gleaves. Can you hear me all right back there? Back there? Good. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to Grand Rapids, uh, hometown of the last sensible man to live in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I've lived there for more than 30 years, and I know this is true. Uh, it's great to see old friends from Grand Valley uh, here and to meet new friends, and I'm especially delighted to see my friend, Colonel Ralph Houndstein, again. Ralph, for a couple of years, as many of you know, before World War II, was the city editor of the paper here, the newspaper, uh, and uh, we've exchanged reminiscences about being old newspaper men. I, for many years, was a newsman in uh, mostly the Washington Post newsroom. And uh, I, I told him the story when we met the last time of my relationship as a recovering journalist now <laughs> to the profession of journalism. And I told him that this is a story that my daughter, who is a surgeon, told me. And it's about the world's first brain transplant. And the night before the procedure, the doctor went into the patient's room and said, congratulations, sir, you're about to have the world's first brain transplant, and you have a choice as to the kind of brain you can receive. <laughs> you can have the brain of an army officer. That will cost you $100 an ounce. You can have the brain of a professor of history, tenured. That will cost you $200 an ounce. Or you can have the brain of a journalist. But that'll cost you $1,000 an ounce. The patient said, $1,000 an ounce? That's outrageous. Why is it so expensive? The doctor said, do you have any idea how many journalists it takes to get an ounce of brain? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mary Eileen. <laughs> That's an easier story to tell as a recovering journalist. At any rate, I'm delighted to be here tonight. I'm going to talk for a bit, and then we'll open it up to your questions and comments in hope of converting a lecture into a conversation. Jack London said that rather than sit back and wait for inspiration, a writer ought to light out after it with a club. And 15 years ago, I took my club and went out looking. And what I found, what inspired me, was the Second World War. I started a project called the Liberation Trilogy. It was intended to tell the tale of the American military's role in the liberation of Europe in World War II. And the first volume begins where the liberation of Europe begins. It's not in Europe. It's in North Africa. And the second volume migrates as the forces uh, of the British and the Americans migrated across the Mediterranean and tells the tale of Sicily and southern Italy. Volume three, The Guns at Last Light, which was published a year ago and, is, as uh, Gleave said, is out in paperback today, opens on May 15, 1944, at St. Paul's School on Hammersmith Road in London, where Eisenhower, Churchill, Patton, Bernard Montgomery, King George VI, and several dozen of the most senior commanders in charge of the operation known as Overlord, the invasion of France, have gathered for the last time to review the plan for the invasion of France. They met in an auditorium at St. Paul's known as the Model Room. 
They were sitting on hard wooden benches, normally reserved for schoolboys. The poet John Milton, among other English luminaries, had gone to St. Paul's. It was cold as a meat locker in the model room, despite the fact that it was mid-May, and the generals and the admirals were bundled up in their overcoats. On the floor of the cockpit of the auditorium was an enormous plaster of Paris relief map of that part of France where the River Seine spills into the Atlantic, a scale of six inches to the mile. And as the plan was reviewed, a British brigadier wearing no skid socks shuffled across the map with a pointer, pointing to different geographic locales as it came up in the discussion of the plan. The beaches, for example, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword, and towns that would soon become famous on what would be the most famous battlefield on Earth, St. Lo, Cherbourg, Cannes, and over on the corner, Paris. Well, we are about to commemorate the 70th anniversary of D-Day, so I thought it would be appropriate to talk about the Second World War a bit this evening and try to put it into some kind of perspective 70 years after the fact. The author, Stephen Ambrose, who did much to revive popular interest in the Second World War, said in 1991, I fear that by 1995, all of us are going to be sick unto our death of World War II. There may very well be a danger of overdoing World War II. Yet we, here we are, 70 years after the fact, still reading about it, thinking about it, commemorating it. The historian Will Durant once calculated that in three and a half millennia of recorded human history, there have only been 256 years in which there was not a war in progress somewhere. War is what we do as a species. Among human activities, it's so commonplace that J. Glenn Gray, who was a very erudite World War II veteran, suggested that Homo sapiens should perhaps be renamed Homo furens, man the fighter. What is it about this particular war that beguiles us? I suspect it's because of three aspects. The war's magnitude, the war's moral disposition, and the war's enduring consequences. And it's these characteristics I'd like to examine briefly. John Updike, who was arguably the greatest American man of letters before his death not long ago, called World War II the 20th century's central myth. He called it a vast imagining of a primal time when good and evil contended for the planet. A tale of Troy whose angles are infinite and whose central figures never cease to amaze us with their size, their theatricality, their sweep. Well, certainly that war shaped and defined an era, a primal time indeed of cunning and miscalculation, of sacrifice and self-indulgence, of malice and mass murder. It was a time when heroes came forth, but it was not an age of heroes if that implies universal nobility and statuary as clean and white and lifeless as alabaster. For many American veterans, infused with irony and skepticism, those twin lenses that soldiering often nurtures, the idea that they embody the greatest generation is just silly. Now, part of that reflects rival claims from the founding fathers, the Civil War generation, but it also acknowledges that the war was too immense to be confined to a single generation. The senior military and civilian leaders, for example, were born mostly in the 1880s and 1890s. President Roosevelt born in 1882, George Patton in 1885, Dwight Eisenhower in 1890, whereas the trigger pullers were mostly born in the 19-teens and 1920s. My father, about to turn 90, born in 1924. The war lasted 2,174 days, and by the end, it was the greatest catastrophe in human history. 60 million dead, 
That's 27,600 dead every day for six years. It's 1,150 an hour. If you were a German boy born between 1915 and 1924, the odds were one in three that by 1945 you would be dead. Of a Soviet population of 190 million, 14% perished during the war. It's absolutely vital to remember that in trying to understand what's going on with Putin and the Russians with respect to the Ukraine. 60 million deaths in six years means a death every three seconds. I won't snap my fingers, Ralph. <laughs> but think about it. One, two, three, dead. One, two, three, dead. That's World War II. George C. Marshall, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, called it a great and terrible epoch. And new words would be required to describe it. Words like genocide and superpower, which was a neologism coined in 1944. Old words assumed new usages, words like holocaust. The war ranged across six continents on those titanic three-syllable battlefields that still serve as historical mileposts, Stalingrad, Tarawa, Anzio, Normandy, as well as in improbable settings rarely associated with the Second World War, places like the Aleutians, Madagascar, Syria, Darwin, Australia. The United States was among the last of the large powers to be drawn into the conflagration. But very quickly, it, the war encumbered all of America. When the war began in earnest on September 1st, 1939, with the German invasion of Poland, the United States Army, still at peace, Ralph remembers well, was a puny weakling. By one measure, it ranked 17th among all armies of the world in terms of combat power, right behind that perennial military powerhouse, Romania. <laughs> the US Army in 1939 comprised 190,000 soldiers. It would grow to 8.3 million by 1945. That's a 44-fold increase. A total of 16,112,566 Americans served in uniform during the war. That was in a country of 130 million. Virtually every family had someone in harm's way. Virtually every American had an emotional investment in our military. Virtually everyone had skin in the game. Compare that World War II army of more than 8 million to our armed forces today when we have an active army of about a half million and shrinking, and a bit more than a million if you throw in the National Guard and Reserve in a country of 317 million. Almost no one has skin in the game. The typical, well, by 1944, 11,000 young men were being drafted into the Army and Navy every day. It was a rate of four million a year. One in three GIs had a grade school education. Only one in four held a high school diploma. Slightly more than one in 10 had attended at least a semester of college. A private, by the way, earned $50 a month unless he earned the Medal of Honor and survived the earning, in which case he got an extra $2 a month in his paycheck. The average soldier stood five foot eight, weighed 144 pounds, but the depression had been very hard on our nation. The desperate need for bodies in uniform, especially infantrymen, to go to places like Normandy, led to the drafting of what were known as physically imperfect men. Standards had been lowered to accept defects that earlier in the war would have kept those men out of uniform. For example, draftees at one time early in the war had to have at least 12 of their natural 32 teeth. How many teeth did you have to have to be drafted in 1944? Zero. 
And that's because the Army and the Navy between them drafted one third of all the dentists in America. And collectively, they extracted 15 million teeth. They filled 68 million more, and they made two and a half million sets of dentures, all to enable those new recruits to be able to masticate the Army ration. I know that sounds like an obscene act, but that was the standard. <laughs> By 1944, a man could be drafted with 2,400 vision, if it was correctable in one eye to 2040. The armed forces made 2.3 million pairs of eyeglasses during the war. The old joke had come true that the army didn't examine eyes, it just counted them. And in fact, you could be drafted with only one eye. You could be drafted if you were deaf in one ear. You could be drafted if you were missing both external ears. You could be drafting if you were missing a thumb or a great toe. You could be drafted if you were missing three fingers on one hand, including your trigger finger. <laughs> Venereal disease had kept many men out of uniform, but that restriction also was lifted and the Army soon was drafting 12,000 VD patients a month, most of them syphilitic. How could they do that? Penicillin, that extraordinary discovery by British scientists in the 1920s, had been taken by British and American industrialists, and a substance that had been made by the gram was then made by the kilogram and eventually made by the ton. Mental and personality standards also in the armed services had been loosened. In April 1944, the War Department decreed that draftees need only have, this is War Department language, a reasonable chance of adjusting to military life. <laughs> Psychiatric examiners on draft boards, however, were advised to watch for two dozen personality deviations. And these included silly laughter, sulkiness, resentfulness of discipline, and other traits that would seem to disqualify every teenager in the United States. <laughs> in addition, the Army began drafting what were deemed moderate obsessive compulsives, as well as stutterers. If you had a malignant tumor, leprosy, or certifiable psychosis, you were probably safe. Well, why this remarkable adjustment of the standards? It was because of the crying need for men. Even in a country of 130 million, we were running out. The Brits did run out. Ernie Pyle, arguably the most enduring of our combat correspondents, called the war an unmitigated misfortune. But in fact, for the victorious allies, there was mitigation. Complete victory over a foe of unexampled iniquity. An existential struggle had been decided so decisively that Field Marshal Alan Brooke, who was chief of the Imperial General Staff, he was George Marshall's counterpart, concluded that, as he put it, there is a God all-powerful looking after the destiny of the world. In the final drive across Europe, the Western Allies in 338 days see, advanced more than 700 miles. They liberated oppressed peoples by the tens of millions. They seized 100,000 square miles of Germany and Austria. They captured more than 4 million prisoners. And they killed or badly wounded an estimated 1 million enemy soldiers. Impressive as that is, let's not forget our other major ally. The Red Army suffered more combat deaths at Stalingrad alone than the United States military lost in all of World War II. Soviet forces also killed roughly nine times more Germans than the Americans and British combined. Well, the cohesion and internal coherence of the Allied coalition assured victory. The better alliance won. 
in contrast to the Axis autocracy, for example, allied leadership ensured certain checks and balances to temper arbitrary willfulness and personal misjudgment. The battlefield itself in World War II offered a proving ground upon which demonstrated competence and equanimity could flourish. And as usual, modern war rewarded ingenuity, collaboration, organizational panache, and the trait that Napoleon most cherished in his generals. Anybody know what that is? Luck. Luck. <laughs> Not to be underestimated in war. You really want it in your generals. Well, the great historian Henry Steele Commager once wrote that the Axis powers failed because they repudiated, I'm quoting Commager, human values and human faith. And from that repudiation flowed all the consequences that led to final defeat. Yes, that's part of it. Russian blood is another part, a big part. But let's linger on the American contribution for a moment. The war cost US taxpayers $296 billion. That's $4 trillion in 2014 currency. To help underwrite a military budget that increased 8,000%, President Roosevelt expanded the number of taxpayers in this country from 4 million to 42 million. The US Armed Forces grew 3,500% while building 3,000 overseas bases and depots and shipping 4.5 tons of material overseas for every soldier sent overseas plus another ton each month to sustain him. In the European theater alone, that prodigy of organization, that was Churchill's phrase for the US, prodigy of organization, shipped 18 million tons of war stuff to Britain and the continent. That's equivalent to the cargo in 3,600 Liberty ships. And the kit ranged from 8,000 military vehicles to footwear in sizes 2A to 22 E. U.S. munitions plants during the war, and there were more than a few in Michigan, turned out 40 billion rounds of small arms ammunition and 56 million grenades. From D-Day to V-E Day, May 8, 1945, GIs fired 500 million machine gun bullets and 23 million artillery rounds. By 1945, the United States had built two-thirds of all the ships in the world afloat. And the United States was making half of all manufactured goods worldwide. The enemy was crushed by logistical brilliance, firepower, mobility, mechanical aptitude, and an economic juggernaut that produced much, much more of nearly everything that Germany and the other Axis powers could bombers, bombs, fighters, transport planes, mortars, machine guns, trucks. Yet the war absorbed barely one third of our gross domestic product. It was a smaller proportion than any other major belligerent. So how almost 70 years after the shooting stopped do we assess the consequences? Well, the legacy of World War II is as profound as the sacrifices that built that legacy. First of all, of course, Allied victory strangled the sinister ambitions of Germany, Japan, and Italy. It brought an end to the British and French empires. It politically fractured both a continent, Europe, and individual countries like Germany, Korea, Vietnam. It led to the creation of both the United Nations and NATO. And it yielded a bipolar world part Soviet part American that persisted for a half century. We Americans emerged from World War II with extraordinary advantages that ensured prosperity for decades, an intact, thriving industrial base, a population relatively unscarred by war. Cheap energy, two thirds of the world's gold supply, and great optimism. As the major power in Western Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Pacific, 
possessing both atomic weapons and a navy and an air force unsurpassed in their power, the United States was ready to exploit what the historian H.P. Wilmot called the end of the period of European supremacy in the world that had existed for four centuries. The war dispelled American isolationism, even as it encouraged American exceptionalism. It encouraged, I think, a penchant for American military solutions to big problems, and a self-regard that led some to label the epic as the American century. Remember what John Adams told us? Power always thinks it has a great soul. Finally, the US military in World War II was a democratizing, thank you, democratizing uh, institution. Even though it was and it remains relentlessly hierarchical, 683 graduates from the Princeton University class of 1942, 84% were in uniform by 1945. And those serving as enlisted men included the valedictorian and the salutatorian. 25 classmates from that Princeton class would die during the war, 19 of them in combat. By 1945, the tectonic plates in this country were shifting as a troop ship sailed into New York Harbor in 1946. A black soldier from Chicago said, glad to be home, proud of my country, irregular as it is, determined it could be better. Well, demythologizing is the task of historians and it should begin and end with the recognition that the most excruciating legacy of World War II is suffering. One, two, three, dead. 13 US divisions in Europe suffered at least 100% casualties. Five more exceeded 200%. From all theaters, American service casualties in the war included 1,700 left blind, 11,000 with at least partial paralysis of one or more limbs, and 18,000 amputations among American soldiers. A woman named Patricia O'Malley was a year old when her father, Major James O'Malley, a battalion commander in the 12th Infantry Regiment, was killed by a sniper in Normandy. She later wrote of seeing his headstone for the first time in that extraordinary cemetery at Colville, above Omaha Beach. And she wrote, I cried for the joy of being there and the sadness of my father's death. I cried for all the times I needed a father and never had one. I cried for all the words I had wanted to say and wanted to hear but had not. I cried and cried. The Australian uh, war correspondent Osmer White, who bore witness both in the Pacific and in Europe, when he was assigned as a reporter to Patton's Third Army, later wrote, the living have the cause of the dead in trust. We, the living, 317 million strong in America, have the cause of the dead in trust. I mentioned that the United States during World War II put more than 16 million into uniform during the war, and of those, about one million remain, and that number will slip below a million later this year. Ten years from now, in 2024, the number of surviving American veterans from World War II will be below 100,000. And in 2036, which is the last year for which government demographers have done projections, the number will be fewer than 400. It's less than half the size of an infantry battalion. Well, unnerving is that slow march to the grave may be. For the historian, frankly, it means little. World War II is the most documented event in human history, in both primary and secondary sources. The US Army alone, one service, one country, produced 17,120 tons of records during World War II. That's the equivalent to the payload in 5,000 B-17 Flying Fortress bombers. We could have just 
flown over Berlin and buried the Germans in paper. <laughs> but in sifting through those 17,000 tons, it's good to remember, in the words of the great Civil War historian Shelby Foote, a fact is not a truth until you love it. A fact is not a truth until you love it. We're looking for facts to love, to tease coherence and intimacy from the past, to find those fine brush strokes that bring the dead to life. They have to breathe. They must walk and talk. They have to engage us intellectually and emotionally because the narrative writer's true calling is to bring back the dead. I write about war because war is a great revealer of character. The extravagant stress of combat reveals character, it refracts character, it allows you to see the inner components the way a prism refracts light, allowing you to see the inner spectrum. Some soldiers are classically heroic, most are not. I find myself drawn to those who are not. During the war, about 291,000 Americans were killed in action, 400,000 dead altogether. In 1947, the next of kin of all Americans who had died and whose bodies had been recovered overseas, and that was nearly all those uh, who had died in Europe and the Pacific and whose bodies were recovered who weren't lost at sea, those next of kin were given a one-time opportunity to fill out quartermaster form number 345. And they were asked whether they wanted to leave their sons, and they were mostly sons, overseas for burial in one of about a dozen American Battle Monuments Commission cemeteries, or to have them repatriated and brought home for burial. You get a one-time choice. About 40% chose to leave their soldier overseas, and about 60% chose to bring them home. Regardless of the ultimate disposition, it cost $564.50 for each dead soldier's ultimate burial. Every grave was opened by hand, and the remains of every dead soldier sprinkled with an embalming compound of formaldehyde, aluminum chloride, wood powder, clay, and plaster of Paris. The remains were then placed in a metal casket with a satin pillow. Labor strikes in the United States caused a shortage of casket steel, and there were further delays in trying to find enough licensed embalmers. In warehouses in Cardiff and Cherbourg and other cities in Europe and elsewhere in the Pacific, the dead accumulated. Finally, the SS Joseph V. Connolly, the first of 21 ghost ships from Europe and Pacific, sailed from Antwerp with more than 5,000 soldiers in her hold. On October 27, 1947, the Connolly berthed in New York. Stevedores winched the caskets from the hold two by two in specially designed slings. And a great diaspora began of these dead and those that followed as they traveled mostly by rail across the Republic for burial in their hometowns and in national cemeteries. Among those waiting was Henry A. Wright. He was a widower. He lived in southwest Missouri near Springfield. One by one, his dead sons arrived at the local train station. Sergeant Frank H. Wright, killed on Christmas Eve, 1944, in the Bulge. Then Private Harold B. Wright, who had died of his wounds in a German prison camp on February 3rd, 1945. And finally, Private Elton E. Wright, killed in Germany on April 25th, just two weeks before the war in Europe ended. Gray and Stoop, the elder Wright, watched as the caskets were carried into the house and placed in the bedroom where each of those boys had been born. Neighbors kept vigil overnight, 
They carpeted the floor with roses, and in the morning, they bore their brothers to Hilltop Cemetery for burial side by side by side. That's how the dead came home. But what of their belongings? What are the things they carried? Well, long before the dead came home, these things had been coming home. At a large warehouse on Hardesty Avenue in Kansas City, the U.S. Army Effects Bureau had begun as a modest quartermaster operation with fewer than a half dozen employees in early 1942. That expanded to more than 1,000 workers, and by August 1945, they were handling 60,000 shipments a month, each laden with the effects of American dead from six continents. Hour after hour, day after day, shipping containers were unloaded from a rail freight car, from rail freight cars onto a receiving dock and then hoisted by elevator to the depot's 10th floor. Here, the containers traveled by assembly line conveyor belt from station to station down to the seventh floor as inspectors pawed through the crates to extract pornography, ammunition, perhaps amorous letters from a girlfriend you didn't want a grieving widow to see. And workers used grinding stones and dentist drills to remove corrosion and blood from helmets and web gear, and laundresses took pains to scrub bloodstains out of uniforms. A detailed inventory was then pinned to each repacked container, and it was stacked in a storage bin, and all the while, typists in a huge adjacent room banged out letters, 70,000 letters a month by the summer of 1945. And the gist of those letters was this, dear sir, dear madam, we have your dead son's stuff. Do you want it back? Where should we send it? Well, over the years, effects bureau inspectors found amazing things in those effects. Tapestries, enemy swords, a German machine gun, an Italian accordion, walrus tusks, shrunken head, a tobacco sack full of diamonds. Among thousands of diaries also collected in Kansas City was a sn small notebook that had belonged to Lieutenant Herschel G. Horton, 29 years old. He was from Aurora, Illinois, not terribly far from here. Shot in the right leg and hip during a firefight with the Japanese on New Guinea, Horton had dragged himself into a grass shanty, and in the several days that it took for him to die, he wrote a final letter home to his family. It began, my dear, sweet father, mother, and sister. I lay here in this terrible place, wondering not why God has forsaken me, but why he is making me suffer. The first duty is to remember. Our current poet laureate, Natasha Trethway, ends her poem, Pilgrimage, which is about a visit to Vicksburg with these lines. In my dream, the ghost of history lies down beside me, rolls over, pins me beneath a heavy arm. My ambition as someone who has spent a professional lifetime writing about war is for our countrymen also to feel that heavy arm, to feel the palpable presence of those who everything, and in some instances gave everything for us. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. So questions, comments, brickbats. Are there any uh, comparative analysis of the importance between the Asian campaigns and the Europe-African campaigns? And if so, what, what are the conclusions from that? 
Well, um, I'm not sure what you would mean by comparative analysis, but um, the, the truth is that which is most important? Well, if you fought in Europe, <laughs> if you were at Iwo Jima, um, uh, you know, we're fighting a, a, a two ocean war. We're fighting on six continents, really. Uh, and um, you, you, the, the initial, the, the battle plan, essentially, that had been agreed to shortly after Pearl Harbor by President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill was that the preponderance of effort would be placed against the European Axis powers, especially Germany. And that Japan, even though Japan had just done us dirty at Pearl Harbor, would receive uh, subsidiary treatment. And why was that? And by the way, it was one of the very few strategic decisions. It was the first big strategic decision made by Roosevelt and Churchill, and it was one of the very few in which there was unanimity among all the, the military brain trusts for both the British and the Americans. And the reason for that, the reason for the decision and the reason for the, uh, the unanimity of opinion is that it was recognized that Germany was by far the biggest and baddest of the enemies, that Germany's industrial base was far larger than Japan's that Germany had the capacity uh, really to be a very, very difficult foe, especially if we did not get into the fight and the Soviets, who had already made a non-aggression pact with them once, reneged on their obligations to their Western allies and somehow declared themselves neutral. Germany was going to be a lot tougher to beat without all that Russian blood being shed. And so the effort was placed primarily on Europe. Now, it has to be said that the United States Navy, having taken a good look at the Pacific and seen that as their primary theater, didn't pay much attention to that decision. And Ernest J. King, who was the chief of naval operations, sort of quietly shifted uh, the overwhelming share of naval assets to the Pacific. All six marine divisions were in the Pacific. You find very few Marines and no Marine units in Europe. So it's not like we were not fighting the Japanese, obviously. Um, but I think in the long run, that was a wise decision to focus on the Germans. Uh, and I think that you have to say that it was borne out, that the, the, the theory behind it was, was essentially borne out. The Japanese were still fighting after the Germans surrendered, but they were supine. Uh, and it, it was a question of how many of us were going to have to die before they finally surrendered, atomic bomb, all the rest of it. So um, I don't think that there's, a, it's, it's very difficult to make the kind of analysis that you're talking about in any kind of um, uh, rational way. Those who fought in the different theaters are very emotional about their theaters. But that's the historical reasoning behind the level of effort that went into the different theaters. Uh, you mentioned that the Soviets killed many more Germans than the Allies did, maybe nine times as many. Could you comment about the significance of that for the Germans and the Allies in the European campaign? In, in France? Well, um, by the time uh, we have invaded Normandy, June 6, 1944, uh, the, the Russians are really prepared to steamroller into the Third Reich. They are uh, quickly going to run through Poland. And by January 1945, the Russians are uh, 40 miles from Berlin. January 1945. So, and they're killing Germans by the hundreds of thousands. And it's going to get worse. And they're going to rape 2 million German women, by the way, uh, because they're very vengeful. Um, Eisenhower has presumed from the get-go that Berlin is the objective. When they're having that meeting in the model room at St. Paul's, 
they talk about ultimately we're heading toward Berlin. And he presumes that through the fall and winter of 1944 until March of 1945, when he rather abruptly changes his mind and says, we're not going to Berlin anymore. This comes as a surprise to a lot of people, uh, including Bernard Montgomery, and particularly Winston Churchill is very unhappy with this decision. And Eisenhower's logic is this. The political divisions of Germany in general and Berlin within Germany have all post-war divisions. That has all been decided already by the Allies. In October 1944, the partitions basically have been drawn on a map. We know that Germany is going to be divided and split into three zones of occupation, Soviets in the east, Brits and Americans in the west. We end up adding another one with the French. And we know that the same is going to happen to Berlin, that it will have zones of occupation. And this has been agreed to in October, and it is affirmed by the big three at the Yalta conference in early February 1945. Yes, this is what we're going to do. So Eisenhower is looking at the map, and he's seeing several million Soviet soldiers on the doorstep of Berlin. He knows it's going to be a bloody fight because the Germans are showing no signs of giving up. He's told by Omar Bradley and others there could be 100,000 American casualties trying to take Berlin. And he knows that the political decisions, that regardless of who captures it, the other allied powers are going to move in and have their piece of the city and the country. He does, I think, an incredibly smart, practical thing. He says, OK, well, we're not going to go to Berlin. We're going to let the Russians shed some more blood for Berlin. And they do. They have tens of thousands of casualties. If you've ever been to Berlin, there's an enormous mass grave uh, in Treptow Park where those Russian soldiers are buried. Uh, Churchill doesn't like this decision because he believes that um, there is uh, propaganda value and political value in beating the Russians there. But Roosevelt has made it very clear that, first, he doesn't want a conflict. And there have already been some close calls, air aircraft, Soviet and American aircraft, mistaking each other for enemy aircraft. Uh, and particularly, Roosevelt believes, Roosevelt has a month to live, by the way, at this point. Roosevelt believes that it's vitally important that whatever the shape of the post-World War world is, that we're going to have to have some kind of modus vivendi with the Russians. That he's, his ambition is that the alliance that has seen us through the war will somehow be retained after the war and that there will be a, a, a cooperative feeling. And he doesn't want to endanger that by rushing willy-nilly to snatch Berlin away. So that's what happens. And Eisenhower steers the British and American armies under him farther to the south. They aim for, for Dresden. We end up in Czechoslovakia, actually. And he wants to, there's one other factor, too. He wants to split the Reich in half. He wants to cut off Berlin and northern Germany from Bavaria because he is convinced, quite wrongly, ba really bad intel here, Ralph. I'm sure you had nothing to do with it. <laughs> He's convinced that the Germans are planning a final redoubt, a national redoubt, they call it, in the Alps, and that tens of thousands of SS troops are pouring into the Alps, and they're going to fight to the death, and it's going to be impossible to wheedle them out without doing it one mountain crag at a time. This, is, this isn't true. The Germans don't have the capacity to do this. It doesn't even occur to Hitler until very late in the war to try something like this. So at any rate, all of these factors go into the decision making, and that affects what's happening in the late winter of 44, uh, 45, vis-a-vis the Russians. Sir, right there. Or, yeah, right there. Uh huh. Could you talk about some of Hitler's mistakes and uh, rank them according to what was most important for the Allied victory? Huh. How much time you got? <laughs> well, I'll do it briefly. I mean, his first mistake is to fight uh, the Soviet Union. Now, he's got reasons for invading in June 1941. But um, 
uh, he's, he, the Third Reich is basically doomed at that point. W once the Americans get into it, he declares war right after Pearl Harbor against the United States. And so he's fight his generals generally realize this. They see, you know, we're fighting this enormous latent power. We've smashed them pretty good after the invasion of 1941. But they're reconstituting amazingly. The, the, the Soviets have moved uh, a lot of their industrial uh, uh, base to the Urals, and they've got a new, upper, a new capital basically in Kubishev, and they're pulling themselves back together, and they're really, really mad. Uh, and they're going to, as many of them have to die to destroy the Third Reich, are going to die. And then at the same time, he's fighting the Western allies. So that is a, that's a strategic error of the first order. Was it avoidable? Could he have eventually come to uh, terms on a permanent level with the Soviet Union? I, I don't know. That's a counterfactual. Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, he thinks he's a great field marshal. Hitler does. And he's not. So that's a sort of general blanket. He, he, is, he is moving battalions around on the map. He is deciding where battalions should be fit. That's ridiculous. Uh, real field marshals shouldn't be messing with battalions. That's a job for a brigade commander, a colonel, and not for the Fuhrer. So, and he really is convinced that he is channeling uh, Frederick the Great. So that's, a, that's another problem. And he's, He's, a, he's got some very, very fine generals, and he's got a great army, uh, but he thinks that uh, he is uh, supposed to be directing it down to the particulars in a way that is really inimical to success for the German army. So that, those are a few. We could go on and on about that. So. What intrigued you most about the figure of Hitler, the personality, and the drive behind this monster? Um, to be honest with you, I don't find Hitler that intriguing. I don't think, uh, uh, I mean, the, the catastrophe is beguiling, certainly, and it's hard to avert your eyes uh, when you begin looking at it. And obviously, we've all been looking at it for 70 years. I don't find him personally to be that in intriguing a character. Uh, I am more perplexed by the German people, 80 million Germans. They, I mean, they, this is the country of Mendelssohn and Beethoven and Mozart and Schiller and Goethe and all the rest of it. I, I was born in Germany. I lived in Berlin for uh, several years. I have lots of German friends. I don't get it. I don't get it. And you know what? The Germans don't really get it either. Uh, the, the ability of Hitler to um, persuade 80 million Germans to um, do what they did. They did it. And every German school child knows they did it. Every German school child is trotted off to Dachau or Buchenwald or any one of a number of other camps and reminded they did it. Uh, they take it very, very seriously. And they are still 70 years after the fact trying to piece through it. I find other historical figures to be more intriguing, um, uh, you know, more human among other things. Uh, Hitler really is a kind of monster. And um, uh, my attention and interest and affection is, is drawn toward those who are, are flawed. They all have feet of clay. And yet, um, they are m more worthy, I think, of our uh, enduring uh, interest. Part of my ambition is to, to find characters who have been lost to history, whom you perhaps have never heard of, but we ought not forget them. Um, I could name a number of them. Jacob Devers, he was the commander of the U.S. Sixth Army Group. You know Jacob De Jake Devers. There are only three army groups in Eisenhower's force in Western Europe. Montgomery commands one of them. Omar Bradley commands the other. Who commands the third one? Jacob Devers. You know who Jacob Devers was? Well, not many Americans do, and he's a fantastic character. He's second only. He's from York, Pennsylvania. His father was a watchmaker. 
Uh, he's second only to Eisenhower in his uh, ability to get along with allies, a natural penchant for it. Eisenhower is particularly good with the British. Devers has an even tougher problem. He has to get along with the French. <laughs> <laughs> His army group is one American army, the U.S. 7th Army, and the other army is the French 1st Army. And, oh my God, the French 1st Army commander, his name, name is Jean de la de Tassigny. Um, he's a fabulous, he's born to lead other men in the dark of night. He, he's really a great combat leader, but what a pain in the neck. Uh, and uh, he's described as an animal of action. Uh, and uh, Devers is very, very good at handling this guy. Uh, DeLott would come into his office, you know, snap a salute, scream something in French at Devers, who spoke no French. <laughs> French was his worst subject at West Point. <laughs> but Devers uh, did a very smart thing. He brought onto his staff uh, a United States senator who had resigned his Senate seat and taken a commission in the Army as a lieutenant colonel named Henry Cabot Lodge. <laughs> You've heard of him. You haven't heard of Devers, right? <laughs> Henry Cabot Lodge had gone to school, I think, in Switzerland and uh, was fluent in French. And so he acted as both translator and, uh, and, uh, and liaison to, to Delat. And Delat would scream something in French, uh, salute again, walk back to the door, slam the door, come in, salute again, because he'd forgotten to salute enough times. And, <laughs> and so that was, that was Devers' uh, cross to bear, dealing with uh, Delat and other French. So I'm more intrigued by people like that, personally, than, than Hitler. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you again. Much. OK, I've got something for you. In fact, Joe? Thank you. Thank you.